What's going on my city of the galaxy, it's Sentiman here, so back again with another WCW pay-per-view review. So this time going to review Super Brawl 3 at the Asheville Civic Center, right now it's called the Harris Cherokee Center in Asheville, North Carolina on the 21st of February 1993. The attendance for the show was 6,500, the buy rate for the show was 95,000 pay-per-view buys. A downgrade than Super Brawl 2's buy rate, the previous year's pay-per-view, because that show received about 160,000 pay-per-view buys. The main event of that show was Lex Luger for Sustain for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship, and that was Luger's last pay-per-view for the company before going on to the WBF, the World Bodybuilding Federation, and also shit in the bed for the WWF. Anyway, the commentators for the show are Tony Schiavone and Jesse the Body Ventura. The first match to kick off the show, we got a tag team match. We got Marcus Alexander Bagwell, the future birth Bagwell, and Eric Watts. Eric Watts is the son of Bill Watts. Um, I think at this moment of time, I might be wrong about this. Bill Watts is not running WCW. I think he got fired. Um, and he got replaced by Eric Bischoff. I don't want to get into it. I might be wrong about this. Don't quote me on this. So this is basically, yeah, this is the pre-Bill Watts pay-per-view. Because he's no longer running WCW at this time. Um, they're teaming up against Stunning Steve Austin. That's the future Stone Cold Steve Austin. And Flying Brian Pillman. This is the first pay-per-view match for the Hollywood Blondes. They just formed the previous month. Um, the match between uh, yeah, st uh, Stunning Steve, Flying Brian, Bagwell, and Watts. Um, this was a good opener to kick off the show. Um, there were the fans were booing Eric Watts. Uh, but it could be a reason why you know he's the son of Bill Watts, or you know, I think he's a shit wrestler. You know, Watts kind of put on like this crappy headlock onto Brian Pillman. And also, he locked in a crappy Boston leg crap onto Austin. You know, he was not that good. He was kind of exposed in this match. But you got the three good workers in this match. Austin, Pillman, and Bagwell. In the end, um, Bagwell hit a thick, hit like a bridge suplex pin onto Pillman. Austin hit like a, a move off the top rope. Because in the Bill Watts era, he kind of banned like moves off the top rope that Lead, lead you to an automatic disqualification. In 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 in, in this era, in the early nineties, they're still all uh, doing this. If you throw someone over the top rope, that really caused a a disqualification. I kind of they like, stopped it, scrapped it in later years. That was a stupid um rule. And also in this mat in this show, actually, it you got the return of the ring mats. You know, you can tell the Bill Watts era is officially over. Anyway, um, Austin did, did like a move off the top rope to break the pin for. Uh, Pillman pins Bagwell to win this match. Um, and as for the Hollywood Blondes, they went on to become WCW Tag Team Champions the following month in March. Um, they ended up uh, feuding. Um, that will be in late 93, early 94. And Austin will leave the company in 94. You know, he got fired from by Eric Bischoff. You go to WC, uh, sorry, ECW, and also uh, the World Wrestling Federation, and the rest is history. It became a megastar for not just for the WWF, but in pro wrestling. Um, let's move on to the next match. The next match, uh, we got Two Cool Scorpio taking on Chris Benoit. Before I watch and review this show, and when I watched June and watched the show. I never knew that Chris Benoit wrestled in WCW in the early 90s. I thought he debuted for WCW in 1995. I've done my research that Benoit debuted for WCW. This is his first run in the company. People more talk about his second run. That was like 1995 until 2000 because his final pay-per-view WCW was sold out. You know, he won the world title before leaving the company. The following day, you know, because he went into the WWF, you know, fought on the Radicals with, better, you know, with Guerrero, Saturn, Malenko. Another story for another time. Go, go and check out my review of Sold Out 2000. 
No, um, he wrestled in WCW in the early 90s. He debuted in 1992. Um, I think it was in a Class of the Champion show and some house shows. Uh, and, and also, this is his first pay-per-view match in his first run in WCW. But besides that, he was never wrestled in WCW on a full-time basis because he was still wrestling in New Japan at the time because he wrestled in New Japan in 1980, I think it was 89, I think it was in the mid to late 80s. This was after when Canadian uh, Stampede Wrestling was went out of business. Yeah, he got bought out by the WWF, another story from another time. Anyway, uh, Too Cool Scorpio, Leron Pecan, Flash Funk, I'll get to their aftermaths after this match. Anyway, this match for me, in my opinion, this is match of the night. They told a good story between Benoit and Scorpio. Good technical style wrestling. Um, in the end, um, I think Benoit did like a... No, is it Benoit? I think it was Scorpio. Scorpio did like a sick move. I, I think it was like... I don't know what it's called. I think it's similar to a hook. A, it's like a corkscrew moonsault off the top row. That was cool. Um, I thought this match was going to end up with a time limit draw, but it wasn't. In the, in the dying second, it with one second to go, Scorpio pinned Benoit to win this match. And that was it. He didn't really do much in WCW, because at this point, Benoit had one more pay-per-view match. Um, that, I think he, appeared, he showed up at the a Clash of the Champions show. I think it was... I don't know. I haven't got into 1993's Clash of the Champions shows yet. I haven't reviewed them those shows yet. Still on 1991. He ended up like... You know, I think his final pay-per-view appearance will be at the first Slamboree. And then he left the company to go back to New Japan. And also he had a run in ECW before... Yeah, returned to WCW in 1995. To be part of the Four Horsemen. Scorpio stick around in WCW. He debuted in 1992. He ended up leaving the company in 1994. He had a, a, a run also in ECW. You know, that's before, you know, it was Eastern. And then it became Extreme. And then he had a run in the WWF, the World Wrestling Federation as Flash Funk. And also part of the Job Squad in the Attitude Era. That was match number two. Uh, match number three... Um, we got the British, I think we got, yeah, the British Bulldog, uh, taking on Bill Irwin. Um, this was the British Bulldog's first pay-per-view match for the company. Um, because he came from, uh, WWF, he got fired from the company in late 1992. According to Bret Hart's book, uh, Bret said, like, uh, yeah, Bulldog got Fired for taking growth hormones, you know, steroids. I don't think it was steroids. It was type of a performance hunting drug. Um, alongside the Ultimate Warrior, he got fired. He came back in 1994. Um, I'll talk. I'll explain more later on after this match. Um, at this point, they yeah, he's kind of like a European draw because later on in 1993 for WCW, they did their first tour in Europe. The reason why they brought Bulldog to WCW, he was a European draw. He was the European draw in the World Wrestling Federation. That's the reason why he challenged Bret Hart and win the Intercontinental Championship at SummerSlam 1992. And also, you know, in a, yeah, I think he draw in Europe. That's the reason why they brought him. Um, I, I don't want to get into it. Um, that's before my time. You know, I'm 26, not... 36. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the match between Bulldog and Irwin, it was, not, it was nothing that much to talk about. It was just basically getting the Bulldog over. In the end, Bulldog hit the running power slam onto Irwin to win this match. And afterwards, he cut like a, a pro, pro match promo on uh, with Shivani. He said about he wants to challenge the WCW World Champ. He want to become WCW World Champion. He challenged Vader. He will face Fader at Super Brawl in uh, not Super Bowl, sorry, Slamboree, the first Slamboree pay per view in May. Unfortunately, he didn't in never uh, leave uh, Slamboree as the world champion. It's a shame he never become world champion in both in WCW and the WWF. It could be a reason why. It could be personality. Maybe he's okay in the as a talker. You know, so I think people don't understand him because of his accent because he's from. He's not really from Manchester. He kind of he grew up. He kind of born in outside of Manchester called Farnsworth. It's kind of like outside of Bolton. So, 
you can't, he's not really Mancunian. I can tell by his accent. He's kind of like from Bol outside of Bolton. It's it's called Farnsworth. Go look. Just type in Wikipedia. Type in British Bulldog. And you you see how his uh his birthplace where he's born what uh birthplace he's from. You know he's from yeah he's yeah he's from Farnsworth, England. Um anyway, it's a, yeah it's a shame. You know he was yeah he was tag team champion and a mid card champion in the WWF. I don't think he won. He didn't want a single championship in WCW in his two runs of the company. You know, he left the company in late 1993. He came back to the WWF in in the summer of 1994, the the following year, teaming up with Luger. Another story for another time. That was match number three. Oh, yeah, uh, match number four. Uh, we got Katniss Jack. You know, future Mankind, future Dude Love, Mick Foley, Taken on, Mr. Wonderful, Paul Nondor. At this time, Captain Jack is now a babyface. He broke away from this group with um, Vader, Holly Race, and Ondor. Um, yeah, um, Captain Jack is a babyface. He's better off as a heel. He work as a heel. He become a heel. Um, a following, the following year in ECW, when he was ECW, like in 94, 95 period, you know, feeding with Terry Funk. Um, the start of this match, this is a false count anywhere match. Um, the start of this match, you had Catless Jack, um, chasing Mr. Wonderful with a fucking shovel. <laughs> you know, um, this match was physical. You know, Mick Foley, Catless Jack, he basically bumped his ass off. Um, you know, there's one more of the match. He did like a, a, a really an elbow onto the exposed concrete. Um, he kind of hit uh, Orndorff with a sunflip powerbomb roll up onto the exposed floor because he removed the ring mat. He didn't the the sunflip roll up uh, powerbomb was basically a but he kind of botched there a bit. It it didn't turn out that great. Anyway, it was it was a good fun brawl like. One more of the match, um, Orndor basically suplex, uh, Cactus Jack onto the steel barricade. Yeah, he was bumping his ass off. Um, and the really some books of the match, uh, Orndor worked on the leg of Cactus Jack, you know, the knee. Because we- he's wearing like a knee brace at this time. I mean, uh, Mick Foley has a, a really previous experiments with knee injuries over his career. He kind of worked, yeah, he worked on the leg of, um, uh, Mick Foley, you know, Cactus Jack. Lock Cactus Jack with the fickle leg lock. Um, I don't know why he's. That's not even his submission at the time. Not really. I don't really follow Mr. Ondor's uh, career in pro wrestling. You know. Um, it was a return of the legend. I'll get to that a little bit sh- later on in this review. He kind of t- he took off. Yeah, Cactus Jack's knee brace. He kind of used it as a weapon. Like one time, he kind of ran. He kind of hit him with a hit the the knee brace onto Cactus Jack. Cactus Jack bumped his ass off the ring apron. On he splattered his back onto the ring mat, onto the floor, not exposed floor, but on the ring mat. Um, it's not on the same level as you know the 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 spot at the Bullet Room Brawl match at SummerSlam '96 match between the Undertaker and Mankind. On Undertaker, you know, fighting on the ring apron. Undertaker managed to knock off Mankind off the ring apron. He kind of splattered into the ex- exposed floor. You know, that's not on the same level. You know, he just took that risk. You know, that really, like, fans really get respect on Mick Foley. He just, like, he takes these hardcore, like, bumps. You know, he's very lucky he's not dead. Um, anyway, so, in the end, um, Paul Orndor, this is weird. <laughs> this is kind of weird. So, Orndor teasing, he's doing like the power driver side. And also, he's doing the Hulk Hogan's posing, like the the ear fit, like it, you know, hands to the ear. I don't understand why he does that because Hogan is still not, he's still with WWF. He's not at WCW yet. I think he's friends with Hogan in real life. I might be wrong about this. Don't quote me on that. Or he could be like, one time he did like an advert promoting the Hulkamania workout set. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> Having another wrestler promote another wrestler's workout set. Jesus Christ, I know we're getting to it. So, in the end, uh, Catless Jack hit um, Mr. Wonderful Pornondorf with the shovel to win this match. So, we're moving on to the next match. The next match, uh, we got another tag team match. There only, there's only two tag team matches on this show. Uh, we got the Rock and Roll Express. Um, that is 
Ricky Morton, yeah, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson taking on the heavily bodies. That is Stan Lane, Sweet Stan Lane, and Dr. Tom Pritchard, um, with Jim Cornette in his corner. At this time period, WCW was in this working relationship with Smoking Mountain Wrestling. That was, you know, was Jim Cornette's promotion at the time. Um, they're also teamed up with, with in a working relationship with the WWF. That will be later on in 1993. Um, yeah, basically before they started the match, they kicked uh, Bobby Eaton out. I I don't understand why. I understand. I feel they, I wish they'd gone with the Battle of the Express in this match. You know, the Rock and Roll Express versus the Midnight Express because Bobby Eaton has the experience with um, Jim Cornette and Stan Lane. You know, they were the Midnight Express in those 80s and 90s. You know, before, you know, Cornette and Stanley left WCW to, you know... I think they, for the Rock and Roll Express... Yeah, this is their first match back as a tag team because in 1991, Ricky Morton basically turned on Robert Gibson, joined the York Foundation to become Rich and Morton. I think he reunited in a different promotion at the time, so... Anyway, they're trying to get Southern Wrestling over. Actually, they're in the South because they're in North Carolina. You know, it's not, you know, they end up, um, did this, the same match later on in the WWF, I'll get to that shortly after this match. Anyway, the match between the Rock and Roll Express and the Heavily Bodies, this was a fun match. It, it kind of ruined, it kind of, Jim Cornette got involved a, a lot in this match. Not a lot, but it kind of brought this match down, in my opinion. You know, like one more of the match without the referee soaring. You got to hit, um, I think it was Ricky Morton in the head with a tennis racket. That was part of Jim Cornette's gimmick. Holding the tennis rackets, you know. Um, in the end, um, I think like he, you know, Cornette kind of pulled down Robert Gibson without the referee um, letting know. Or throwing Robert Gibson over the top rope without the referee knowing. Because if the referee saw that, that's the automatic disqualification. Throw in someone over the top rope, that is disqualification in those early to mid 90s WCW. Jesus Christ. I'm glad they stopped it, you know, that is stupid. Um, in the end, uh, Bobby Eaton trying to help the heavily bodies try to win this match. He hit like a move. He's trying to hit the move onto Ricky Morton, but instead he accidentally hit Tom Pritchard. In the end, um, uh, Morton pins Pritchard and uh, Gibson stopping Stanley to break up the pin for. Yeah, the Rock and Roll Express won this match. The fans are more into the Rock and Roll Express less than the Heavily Bodies. Because the Rock and Roll Express, they were the most established tag team at the time. And also the most over tag team at the time. I think they were past their peaks. They can still go, you can tell, at this time. I think right now they're in their well, 60s, 70s. Back then, they're probably in their like late 30s, early 40s. I might be wrong, don't call me on that. They'll have a rematch later on in the year in November at the Survivor Series in the World Wrestling Federation because like I said, SMW, Smoking Mountain Wrestling, they're in this working relationship with WCW and then later on in the World Wrestling Federation. That uh, Survivor Series 93 was in Boston trying to get um, Southern Wrestling over for the Northern State of America, you know. I don't think they did that well and... In the rematch at Survivor Series between the Heavily Bodies and Rock and Roll Express, Jimmy Del Rey will be the substitute of Sweet Stan Lane. Don't want to get into it. So moving on to the next match. The next match, um, we got the first championship match of the night. We got Dustin Rhodes, the future Goldust, defending the United States Championship against Max Payne. The name in the character after, I think it was a movie first with Mel Gibson and then the video games and then the sequels. I don't understand why WCW never got a lawsuit. I don't want to get into it. So before I review this show, I've done my research that the original match, it was supposed to be Dustin Rhodes versus Ron Simmons for the United States Championship. Unfortunately, Ron Simmons got injured. So basically, Max Payne is the last minute replacement of Ron Simmons. The match sucked. It was boring. A lot of rest holds. I don't, I'm not a big fan of rest holds, man. Just basically, it's, it, sometimes if you do it once or twice, I'll be okay. But in this match, you know, if you do it all the time, it brings the quality of the match down. 
I think like Max Payne was working on the arm of Dustin Rhodes. In the end, uh, Rhodes locked Max Payne in an adorable stretch. And yeah, Max Payne basically hold on the referee, put his arms on the referee. You can't do that. Put your hands on the referee. That's an extremely no-no. And Rhodes retained the title via disqualification. And afterwards, that led up to a beatdown brawl. And that was it. <laughs> you know, if they cut this match, well, it was boring. It was about 10, 11 minutes long. If they cut it half the time, it might be a, a better match. Or if, like, if Ron Simmons was fit, it could be a much better match because Ron Simmons and Dustin Rose are better workers. Max Payne, not too much. I think he was entering with a rock and roll gimmick. Unfortunately, it was just a like a cr cheesy, goofy version of it. Not like the um, not like on the same level as the Rock and Roll Express. <laughs> Sorry, I burped. Um, as for Max Payne, he stuck around in WCW until 1994. He went on to the WWF in 1995. He was Man Mountain Rock, and then in 1995, uh, not sorry, 2003, I think. I think he was filing a lawsuit over what Max Payne. I don't want to get into it. So moving on to the next match. The next match. Um, this is for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Before that, we got the return of Ric Flair. It's really funny that the previous WCW pay per view I reviewed was Super Brawl One. That was Ric Flair's final pay per view in his first run with the company because his final match with WCW was against Tsumi, was a Tsumi Fujinami for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship for going to the WWF. Yeah, this was Ric Flair's first pay-per-view back in the company. He spent a year and a half for the World Wrestling Federation. He became a two-time WWF Champion, won the Royal Rumble match, did the Tears in My Eye promo. His final pay-per-view appearance for the World Wrestling Federation was the Royal Rumble. Uh, I covered that show the previous month and also his final match with the World Wrestling Federation was on Monday Night Raw, the Raw after the Royal Rumble in the match against Mr. Perfect, the loser leaves town, Flair lost this match and he went on to go back to WCW, yeah I'm back and also he said like um um uh, yeah yeah the next match we got um Great Muta defending the NWA World Heavyweight Championship against Barry Windham, Flair said in the promo says uh, Wyndham and Muta facing the world title that he never lost and he was bang on point because Flair never lost the world title in his final run, in the final month of his final run in the company. You know, his first one in the company against Fujinami, he never lost the world title. He put the, he really put a deposit on the world title when, you know, he was born in hands with Jim Hurd, left the company, took the world title with him to go to the WWF. Anyway. So here's the backstory. So there is no build to this between Wyndham and Muta. Muta won the world title from Masamono Chono in the Super Show. Was it the Super? Was it got the so, Yeah, the Super Showdown show. They call it the what was it the Fantastic Story in the Tokyo Dome. Basically, at this time period, WCW were doing shows in Japan. Or I think they were in this working relationship with New Japan Pro Wrestling. So, I think, yeah, I think it's called Super Showdown. This is before WWE will do the Super Showdown in Australia and then in, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, they did that final show in the Tokyo Dome. Yeah, uh, Muta defeated uh, Masamono Chono for the world title. Yeah, the world title is back for the first time in two years. Um, they call it the NWA World Title. Um, this is playing the seeds of what WCW will do. You know, they'll do the experiment with two world championships. Um, and the WWE will do it years later in the first brand split, and also right now in our current timeline. Anyway, uh, the match between Wyndham and Muta, um, Ric Flair was on commentary. It was good. I think it was. It wasn't. It was a. Good, it was a good match, not a great match. Um, I think the fans were not into this match. They're more into Flair because he just came back. I think it was the wrong. You know, if it was a different, if Flair came back at the next pay per view. Maybe the fans were not really crap on it. it. Yeah, like it was a yeah, it was a good match. It could be a much better match. It was a bit boring sometimes, but they told a good story between Wyndham and Muta. Um, in the end, um, Wyndham hit like a DDT onto the Great Muta to win this win this match and become the new NWA World Champion. Um, you know, I think it was a big 
highlight point in his career for Barry Windham. He never became world champion. You know, he was in uh, W. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he was never was WCW world champion he, because he was part of the Horsemen. He left the company. I think he had a run in the WWF. Didn't went, went didn't went anywhere. He came back in the WWF in the mid nineties as was it the tat was it the what's it called the Stalker the Widowmaker. You know, Jesus Christ, I want to get into it. Um, that was a highlight point for Barry Wyndham's career, winning the world title. It was a big deal at the time. So, in the end, Flair trying to put the world title belt on the waist of Barry Wyndham. Wyndham basically gave Flair the cold shoulder, a uh, cold sh shoulder. Sorry, kind of stumbled, did the face down and left. This has set up a rivalry between Ric Flair and Barry Wyndham. They set up the match at Beach Blast. Flair defeat Wyndham for the title. And later on, the, the NWA World Heavyweight Championship become the International Championship. The reason why? Because, because WCW later on in the autumn of, two, of 1993, they broke away from the NWA. Um, because the, the first pay-per-view, uh, not post-NWA era. Because at this time period, WCW was under the NWA. Because the only two promoters under the National Wrestling Alliance were WCW and then ECW. And then when W yeah when ECW you know they broke they truly broke away from the NWA that'll be in 1994. WCW broke away the NWA in 1993. Basically, the NWA, the National Wrestling Alliance, were on its last legs. I don't want to get into it. Another story for another time. So and yeah, the that pay, that first pay per view when WCW broke away from the NWA that will be Fall Brawl 1993, the first, first Fall Brawl in WCW history. Go and check it out. I review that show. Really late, uh, really last uh, autumn. Sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit. Um, so, yeah, the Wind and Muta match, it could be better. If they took away five minutes off this match, it could be better. Or even Flair did not show, made his return on this show. I think the fans are more into it more, but that's just me. So, moving on to the main event. The main event, we got Vader vs. Sting in a White Castle Fear strap match. So... Sting and Fida have been feuding since 1992. They fought at the Great American Bash. Uh, Fida defeats Sting for the championship. They fought at Starcade. So this, this is the third match of the rivalry. At this time period, they were doing the whole mini movies clips. You know, they're trying to build the building a rivalry to the pay per view the match on the pay per view mini movies. Man, at the time, 982 in 1993, WCW. Unfortunately, that not got over because it was so cheesy as shit. I don't want to get into it. Um, I might do a future video on that in the future. But the time being, I'm going to talk about this match. Um, this is similar to the previous match between Wyndham and Muta. It was a good match, but not a great match. So, like I said, it was same as it was a bit boring. If they took about 10 minutes off this match in the main event... It'll be a, and also they were doing like this strap match. You have to touch all four corners in the ring. I hate that. You know they do in pro wrestling. Whatever era or whatever company they do, you know they asked to do strap matches, touching all four corners. Why could just be like you have to whip each other. You have to win by pinfall or submission. I hate that. You know you know every time like one person trying to hit all three corners and the other his opponent trying to do like a opponent. Tuck, like basically doing a move onto the floor or onto the ring or clothesline or any type of move trying to do, you have to restart it all over again. I hate that. It gets repetitive. Um, it was a good match. It wasn't a terrible match. You know, Fader was bleeding, fucking bleeding, in the back, in the face. You know, um, you know, it was physical. I think that one time uh, Sting picked up Fader because Fader is about 400, 300, 400 pounds. Sting, you know, he's about 200, I say 250, you know, because Sting's, you know, background before he was a pro wrestler, he was a bodybuilder. He picked up Fader, touching all four corners. There was a referee bump. Ref, he kind of tripped over the referee. I think it was Randy Anderson. It's not Nick Patrick. Nick Patrick refereed the Wyndham and Muta match for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. And by the way, Fader was the WCW World Champion. He did not put the world title on, on the line on this show. It's a bit of a downer. Um, in the end, um, uh, Fader hit the Fader bomb onto Sting. Touch three corners. Sting trying to fight. He accidentally uh, kicked Fader. Fader kind of stumbled. Hit the fourth and final corner to win this match. Um, not, it, like I say, it was a decent match, but not a great one. 
you know, like I said, if they just did like a pinfall submission match or even like um, cut the match down about five to ten minutes, that could be a bad match. That could be match of the night. But unfortunately for me, it let down for me for once. And as for the rivalry between Sting and Vader, they had a blow off at Beach Blast in July of that year in a tag team match Sting and Bulldog versus Vader and Sid. They will never fight again until 1994 at Slamboree for the world title. Unfortunately, it was not on the same level as the rivalry in 1992 and 1993. Anyway, so my final rating for Super Brawl 3 is a 9 out of 10. This was good. Um, I like the 1991 Super Brawl show. He had some shit, but besides that, still a good undercard. This was better than Super Bowl 1. You know, I'm talking about Super Bowl 3. Um, besides, in, in the OK, you had basically Bulldog versus Bill Irwin. It was just basically getting the British Bulldog over. And the United States title match between Dustin Rhodes versus Max Payne. Besides that, you had some really good matches. A really good undercard, like the opener, the Hollywood Blondes versus Bagwell and Eric Watts. A fun fourth count anywhere match between Paul Orndorff versus Cactus Jack. The NWA World Title match and the main event between Sting versus Fader. They were good but not great. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed my review of Super Brawl 3. Leave your thoughts in the comments section below, smash the like button, and subscribe to the Central Mind Network on YouTube for more wrestling videos, Marvel videos, game streams, and more. Next time, so I'm going to still continue reviewing Super Brawl shows going into March, and then afterwards I'm moving on to one center. So let's go into the Monday Night War period. So I don't know. So let's review. I don't know. Let's review properly. I don't know. How about Super Brawl 8? No, fuck it. Let's go. Let's go to 1996. So I'm reviewing Super Brawl 6. Oh boy, Pillman Taskmaster, I respect you, Booker Man, that is the next pay-per-view to review. This is Ascension Man officially signing out, check you later.